Hi, welcome to Café with Cavanha. Today we are receiving Carlos Mastrangelo and Bruce Krager. Our agenda is a FPSO's market. How they see FPSO market worldwide and more specific in Brazil. Good morning, Mastrangelo. Good morning, Bruce. Good morning. Bom dia. It's a pleasure to be here. Bom dia. <laughs> Good. May I ask each one to make a self-introduction, telling us the professional activity? That's it. Uh, I, can, I can start. Uh, I'm, uh, my name is Carlos Mastrangelo, as Cavani uh, introduced. I'm in the FPSO business since the 80s, when I joined Petrobras in 85. And uh, I, I went through many areas from the operation, regulation, and headquarters, new technologies, research center. And I moved it to the U.S. to be to introduce the first FPSO here in Gulf of Mexico. And uh, the, Mr. Bruce. Okay, I started uh, designing rigs for what is now Transocean, and I did subsea and floating production systems for a company called Seaflow, and then for what became Vetco. I uh, joined Oceaneering in 1988 to start their floating production group, uh, primarily on FPSOs, and went from there to ABB into uh, uh, MTech. And uh, during that time, I was consulting, working on Cascade Chinook with Mastrangelo. So we worked together on that. And then I joined um, McDermott and most recently worked for Endeavor Management, where I've been for the last eight years. Excellent. Thank you, Carlos and Bruce. Thank you very much. May I ask you both, uh, what are the main differences among countries considering FSO markets? What can you tell us? The, the, the way the, the market is, uh, uh, I see Brazil is the most hot place for the FSO business. Uh, to, to compare, you, you, uh, we have today one, maybe one uh, FSO in Australia, one or two in uh, West Africa, one in Norway. Uh, but in Brazil, that's the, the place for, for FPSO business. That's uh, compar comparing the worldwide uh, marketing for FPSOs, that's my... Yeah, there's, uh, there's more FPSOs in Brazil than anywhere else in the world. And there's over 200 FPSOs in the world, but the, the majority, almost a fourth of them, are in Brazil. Petrobras being the single biggest user of FPSOs, both owned and leased. And so I think Brazil is kind of the home of the FPSO, mainly because of deep water and lack of pipelines. But what's the reason for that? Because the solution that Brazil adapted for, for production is different from other parts of the world? No, uh, let, let me, let's make a kind of uh, history. In the past, Petrobras was well known as a semi-submersible company. Uh, in the past, uh, the, the FPSO, Petrobras had, had one FPSO in Brazil that was the second in the world, P.P. Moraes. And uh, I think I told you that uh, long ago, the FPSO was considered and classed as a ship, tanker ship. And when in the uh, 90s, uh, 94, came up, the, the, the regulation for class of FPSO that could stay on the location for uh, as long as the design is uh, is designed, uh, that it was a kind of boom in the world. But in Brazil, it uh, came with a very, very timely uh, momentum because, uh, the, the, as Bruce said, lack of pipeline network. Uh, there is no uh, major... Uh, patent to restrict the, the supplier, mm -hmm. then I think that it was uh, very, very used, uh, uh, adapted pretty well in Brazil. I think the other issue was, or, and continues to be, that FPSOs are particularly good for marginal fields. We can come in, test for a few years, or even produce for a few years and then leave. But then as people began to realize, first because of the class issue and then because of the size issue, but FPSOs have the least amount of weight limit compared to other hull types. Mm -hmm. You can put more on them, so if you also have the storage capability and the offloading capability and the deck capability, it becomes a better unit. And even though it's not as stable as some of the other hull types, in Brazil it's acceptable because the weather is typically in one direction or at least can be spread more. And so they become a very logical place to use FPSOs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is one another coincidence. So that's a kind of... Uh, 
the the uh, the weather condition in Brazil. Uh, you ha we have in the Santos Basin more than 12 uh, meters AGS. Uh, the, 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 that's pretty high. Mm -hmm. But still, with that weather condition, uh, it's possible to spread more uh, via OCC. That's uh, uh, unbelievable. It, but it is possible because of a coincidence of the weather in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Then it was a, a good match, the way I see it. Interesting. Interesting. Um, uh, considering design, um, uh, construction, operation, and maintenance, how how do you compare leased and ownership uh, uh, units? Uh, is is totally different, I know, but uh, how how can you compare leased and ownership? Oh, I think that's a, uh, if it's owned, if, uh, it's, uh, it's not an impeditive for uh, a leased operation. The the unit can be there are units that are are owned by the, the operator and uh, the operator contracts or lease the, the, the O&M, the operation and maintenance. It's not one, uh, one single role, there are many options. There are leased units that are operated by, by somebody else. Uh, I, I see the, the way Peter Bryce usually contract is one single responsibility to fully lease and operate the unit but uh, there are other options. Is there a trend worldwide? I mean, uh, <laughs> companies are, 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 are moving to uh, have, have own, own uh, units or more leased units? It, it's almost half and half. It's about 45% that are leased right now and 55 that are owned. And that fluctuates on either side of that number, but it tends to be about half and half. Historically, the short life projects or the smaller companies will often lease because they don't want to own the unit for its full life. Whereas for long life, the operator may choose to own because it's going to be there for so long. And then it becomes a financing issue. Do you want to have to pay for it up front or do you want to pay for it over time? Uh, so I think that's why it ten tends to stay balanced. Yeah, but uh, one, then, one, 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 uh, just sorry. to add something. Um, in, in Brazil, in the past, all the, 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 the F pesos were owned and operated by the, the, the operator, by Petrobras. Then uh, after 2000, that started coming the, 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 the lease of the unit. <coughs> uh, even today, uh, majors prefer one, one type of unit if the project is uh, longer term. Uh, for small, mid-sized companies, if they don't have the in-house competence for uh, doing all the, the phases, including the operation maintenance, they may tend to go to the little unit. That's a kind of uh, average worldwide how it works. Considering total cost of ownership, which one is uh, more expensive? Owned units or leased units? That's a good for you. It's kind of like a car. If you're, if you're gonna <laughs> lease it and turn it right back in, it's a, it's a good solution. If you're gonna keep it a few years, turn it back in. If you know you're going to keep it for 20 years, it's probably better to buy it. So from a financing standpoint, it's simply how long you're going to pay for the lease. And if you're going to continue to pay for something you've already paid for, you probably want to own it. But if you can't afford it, you may say, all right, even though I'd like to own this car, I'm going to lease the car and pay for it out over time. Yeah. So yeah. financing can drive that. Yeah, but um, uh, when, when in the finance, that's a good point. Because uh, uh, in uh, economic analysis, the, the actions, the, the cash flow in the first few years drive the, the NPV. Mm -hmm. Then when you have a unit that can be delivered in a shorter term, it helps a lot in the economics. Uh, but in the long term, as Bruce said, uh, it's a good <coughs> to work. Uh, another point that uh, can drive to one solution to the other, uh, majors tend to go to their in-house more detailed spec if they go to own the unit. Mm -hmm. It's natural. If they go to lease the unit, they are more prone to accept something more relaxed. Understand. And, and the topic of local content in Brazil is very important for people here in Brazil uh, talk about local content. I know that other parts of the world is not the same. 
But uh, what do you uh, could, could bring to us in terms of local content in Brazil and other parts of the world? Well, that, uh, that's a really a hot topic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I can say that. It's, uh, it's uh, reasonable for countries to request a kind of uh, social uh, contribution with local content. Uh, it's uh, used worldwide. It's uh, many countries, even if it's not clear in the uh, regulation, it's, it has some local content requirement. Sometimes it's pretty clear. I think Bruce can, can give a kind of brief. When I move it to the US, uh, the, for, uh, for the first FPSO, the, the critical path initially, we thought the critical path due to the very stri uh, stringent local content requirements was a shadow tanker that uh, to comply with the Jones Act that uh, we, we faced, oh, uh, to be a big problem. Then uh, we are not uh, here to say it's right or wrong. It's there, it's, re it's uh, the problem is to balance uh, the amount of local content, not to damage the, <laughs> the, the, the business. And, and there is a logic to, from the social side, to help countries build up their infrastructure, particularly those that have either lost it. Brazil was a strong shipbuilding nation and had lost a lot of that. We're trying to bring it back, so it certainly was capable of coming back to do that. But I think there's a balance in how much you try to put onto a country. Uh, West Africa continues to struggle with, they have none, and they try to go to 50 or 60 percent local content, which doesn't seem reasonable to me. But I think building it up over time, and Brazil has certainly built it up over time, with the reduction in local content to more reasonable numbers, I think Brazil has a pretty good balance now. And it allow projects to move forward. But sometimes it's just unreasonable to have a very high local content, 60, 70, 80%, when the country cannot provide that content. Yeah, but one, 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 another point that is important to highlight, the, 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 uh, the percentage requested for local content is uh, it's not the only uh, only way to to because uh, uh, you can have for example if you have just one project um, in the in the market and you ask for 100 percent local content on the engineering and uh, basic engineering design detailed design is that possible to be done yes easily one project that's okay and if you have 10 projects at the same time is a kind of way it's not possible then the, the, the synchronization, uh, some countries, they control pretty well this kind of uh, timing for the projects, not to overflow the, the, the local industry. The second point is the specification by itself. If it's uh, uh, compatible with the local capabilities, it's, it's okay. Uh, did you remember the, the MINDOC, the, the the hole, mm -hmm. the design was done to fit the dry dock in Corpus Christi. Yes. If it's, uh, they do a different design, or oh, the, local, the local industry cannot uh, supply the hole. Obviously, yeah. the, you didn't design for, for what's possible to be done. Then uh, depend on the spec also, it's another important uh, point to be considered. Today in Brazil, oh, I think I'm saying, uh, the subsea market is pretty well capable to, to go to a very high local content. If you start changing too much the, the spec, you, you may start uh, seeing the local industry not able to, to supply the, the goods. <clears throat> Is there local content rules in the US? In, in general, no. The, as as Mastrangelo said, shuttle tankers building new ships falls under Jones Act. So vessels that fall under Jones Act have to be built in the US, and we don't build a lot of vessels in the US. So if you wanted a new, different design um, DP shuttle tanker and you had to build it here, it was a long lead item to get that built. It was doable, but it took a long time. Probably more expensive than building in other parts of the world. That's why Jones Act is there to protect the US industry. Uh, but it was, was expensive. Yeah. Nothing else on the FPSO that I can recall fell under a local content requirement. You could bring it from anywhere in the world. Now you may have to pay taxes or duties or tariffs, which we're facing with steel right now on pipelines and things like that. But it's doable, it's just a, it's a cost issue. Um, in Brazil, people were paying the extra cost to not have local content because they couldn't get it done in time. So they were paying penalties to get around local content. 
So there, there's a balance, as we said, and that balance, I think, will be different on the projects, the kind of vessel that's being built, the timing, and some of the components that have to go into it. But uh, uh, many times, the local content is not uh, clear in the, in the uh, you, you mentioned the Jones Act is a very, very stringent local content for, for FPSOs that requires a shuttle. But, uh, for example, in the project, the FPSO that was uh, designed for, for the first FPSO here, uh, when we went to, comp to, 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 to buy some of the instruments, then it was required to have a U.S. Cert uh, certification from the U.S. Coast Guard that certified. Then uh, at the end, uh, you, you give up, okay, I'll buy this one that is already. And many times it's not clear. But uh, it's a kind of, uh, uh, in general, it's more flexible than, than uh, in, in other places. You, you mentioned uh, specification specs, and uh, how can we compare standardized uh, specification and functional specification? Uh, is, is more common for episodes, which one? Uh, I don't think that uh, FPSOs are standardized at all. Uh, Petrobras is, uh, is a great company to standardize, uh, for example, the, the, the lizard unit. They have the GT, they standardize at, at least the way they procure the, 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 the unit. The, the document is the same, it's a template, uh, GTD, that uh, I worked at, uh, many years ago. And uh, then, uh, Every, every bit, you know quickly the demand, what they need in terms of the, 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 the description of the units. You go to the chapter, that's the same chapter. Uh, but if you talk about the standardization of the details, then it's uh, not uh, seen worldwide. I don't know if you saw some standardization in more detail. I think that's right. And so an example could be paint. Some companies will specify they just want it painted or a certain thickness of paint, but others will, will specify each coat, maybe even the color, certainly the amount of paint. Not, one's not better than the other, it's just two different ways to go about it. But a certain company may have found over years that a, a certain kind of paint or thickness buildup is a better way to go. And so they'll go with that. Uh, but if you're a company, and particularly a lease provider, it will generally cost more because you're used to doing it a different way. Mm -hmm. And so if you go out and build your own FPSO, using your prescriptive specs is generally uh, acceptable and, and it's not uncommon. If you're going to take a leased FPSO and you try to put your special specifications on a leased FPSO provider, it will typically slow them down because they have their own way to do it. And if you let them do it their way, and if they lease FPSOs, they have a lot of experience. Mm -hmm. And they want to follow their guidance and let them give you uh, more direction on how you might want to do those, those very small details. We have in uh, worldwide, uh, let's see, four or five uh, very big companies for FPSOs uh, in terms of projects, uh, design, sorry, and, and construction and operation. But the newcomers in Brazil, um, uh, is it, is it easy to come to Brazil as a newcomer for FSO market, or is it complicated to come and to operate here? Uh, I think that's not it's not easy. <laughs> uh, Brazil, but, uh, you can need to realize Brazil is not easy, and it, we are to understand. It's easy when you understand, but it's not easy if you are not embedded in the in the country. Uh, the way I see a uh, Cavanha. Uh, the, the, the way, uh, many times we, 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 we say the way Brazil does the business is the way the Petrobras is doing the business. The yeah. companies, they do differently. But uh, the, the GTD that I worked many years ago, uh, there is a kind of, uh, 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 it's a lessons learned required to be clear how to comply with the document. It's a document that many people think that, oh, it's a functional, it's very thin, then it's easy. Then when they get the, the document, they realize it's not so easy because uh, one single statement, for example, requires a lot. And it's not a document just to contract the unit. It's a document for the operation, for the lifetime of the unit. Then 
newcomers, I think that they are afraid of what's hidden inside. Mm -hmm. uh, I, if I suggest is to have a kind of a training for the companies to make them more comfortable <coughs> to how to make the interpretation, proper interpretation of the, the GTD. That's uh, my view. That's the kind of uncertainties that they have in their minds that makes it more difficult to, to make a proposal. Yeah. It's a long-term commitment. I agree. And, and, and as Mastrangelo said, Petrobras is the, the primary user in Brazil. Therefore, Brazilian FPSOs have reflected what Petrobras wanted. And if you don't understand Petrobras requirements, it's more difficult to compete. But with the new companies coming in, yeah. majors will tend to use their requirements that will be more like West Africa, for example, and maybe a little different than Petrobras. Certainly the procurement process may be different. The regulatory issues will be the same. They still have to meet the Navy requirements in Brazil and the ANP and Obama requirements, uh, which is common to any country you go to. You have to fall into those. But I don't think those are as onerous as just understanding the company. So whether you're bidding with a, a Petrobras or another large major like Shell or Exxon or BP, you're going to have one kind of project. <clears throat> if it's a smaller company and they simply want a functional FPSO to come in, they'll, they'll be more flexible. So, for example, Petrojal One has just gone into Brazil. It's the 11th or 12th time it's relocated, although the first time out of the North Sea. Uh, and while it had significant modifications, it was not because of Brazil. It was because it was dealing with very heavy oil, 14 API. So they had to modify the vessel and spend a lot of money and time getting it ready for the kind of reservoir to deal with, not necessarily because it was going in Brazil. How, how, how many different companies for FSO design operation do we have in Brazil? You know, three, four? Um, it, it's a little awkward because some of the smaller companies may have gotten an old unit. For example, when Shalon was there, it was not operated by any of the majors. It was operated by a much smaller company. And it was bought when a drilling rig was bought. And so mm. there are exceptions. But in general, the three major players are there. The, the three big companies in FPSOs are SBM, uh, MODEC, and BW Offshore. Uh, and, but so and, there, yes, there are other units in Brazil. So, so, they, so there, are, there are different ones that could come to Brazil. Oh, yes. Yes. Well, Petrojal One is a good example, right? It's come in, even though it had never been in Brazil, it was brought in to do that work. Uh, you are talking about the lizard unit. If it's on the unit, uh, it's, uh, the worldwide market can supply. Okay. Okay. Great. Okay. That's great. We appreciate this uh, conversation with Mastrangel and Bruce. It was great, which was very helpful for FSO, that people that work with FSO and production, for sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Cavanha. Thank you. Cavanha.cafe with Brazil Energia Magazine and Ecoa Puc Rio. Thank you.